Electric vehicles are a defining innovation of the green transition. And Brian Gu is at the center of the sector as president of China's answer to Tesla, Xpeng. As a company, uh, we see demand is insatiable. I mean, I think uh, the, the growth uh, trajectory of our sector is very clear. But getting there, there's a lot of problems we're facing today. Brian Gu earned his PhD and MBA in the US before rising to become a top executive at JP Morgan in Asia. I do think, uh, you know, after working with so many different high quality people and companies, you really get the itchy to, to build a company yourself. And that company Brian Gu has helped build, EV maker Xpeng, has risen in the top 20 electric car manufacturers by sales since its founding in 2014. We uh, have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that started in this sector, and I think actually the ones that really made out of the, you know, the, the pack and really be successful are the ones that's truly visionary and sometimes had crazy ideas. We discussed the future of electric vehicles, competing in China, and lessons from his career. Brian Gu, thank you so much for joining us on Leaders with Lacqua. Okay, I'm going to go straight to the point, the icebreaker, maybe the hardest, hardest question you'll ever have to answer. What's the biggest mistake you made early in your career? Well, I think the, you know, there's a lot of changes I've made uh, along my career. Uh, if you think about mistakes, um, um, I would say is, uh, you know, when I decided um, whether I go for Wall Street or go for Main Street. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether that's a mistake, but uh, that certainly has changed you know, my life for the next uh, subsequent 20 years. Uh, I was, uh, um, you know, a student at the Yale School of Management, uh, which is known for public and private management. So there's a you know, group of people that's focused on, you know, sort of the nonprofit world. And then the other group is focused on the uh, traditional Wall Street finance and consulting. And, and I think it was a debate for me coming from academia. I was a scientist before MBA uh, to really make that choice. Um, I choose Wall Street. Uh, which is probably a bigger, you know, leap of difference uh, uh, in my career. Uh, but you yeah, know, but Brian, I think uh, uh, it's worked out. You know, I, I mean, I how do you go from running investment bank at J.P. Morgan to the chief chief executive of uh, Xipeng? It's worked out for you. Well, I think uh, you know, uh, a Wall Street career gave you a confidence that you can deal with anybody in any situation. That's what they tell you, at least. Yeah. But uh, I do think uh, you know, after working with so many different high quality people and companies, you really get the itchy to, to build a company yourself. Uh, and also in a sector that's hugely disrupting uh, the traditional ways of making you know, vehicles and making people's mobility lives. So that's really draw, drove me to make that change. But it's, it's something you have to really have the itch for when you make that yeah. big jump. What advice would you give to someone just starting out now? Well, I think uh, looking back, um, you don't need to really plan for your ultimate career. You need to know where your passion is and you can always get there. That's what I tell my kids. You know, you don't need to worry about, oh, should I study chemistry and then go to, uh, uh, to be a scientist in the lab in order to do research and then to make impact on people's lives. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get there. But if you have a passion that you can identify in your life, um, the path is, is just the path. What's your passion? What kind of chief executive are you? Uh, I'm a very curious person. I, I love to, uh, you know, figure out what the next big thing is. Um, and I did that during banking. Uh, I'm doing that right now at X10. Uh, we're trying to do great things here. Uh, so the passion is always looking for the next big thing. I mean, I imagine it's a very different skill set coming from, you know, a big Wall Street bank to an EV startup. What advice do you have for anyone starting up, especially in the EV world? Extremely exciting, but also extremely difficult. I think that uh, if I were advising other entrepreneurs to get into the sector, I think first thing is that you, ha you cannot have too much realism in the way you approach the, the work. You have to be crazy. Uh, sometimes you have to be viewed as, you know, you know, it's a little bit insane because actually we, uh, have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that started in the sector. And I think actually the ones that really made out of the, you know, the, the pack and really be successful are the ones that's truly visionary and sometimes had crazy ideas. I like that, a little bit of crazy. Who do you look up to? Is there someone in your space, in your industry,
that has been such a disruptor that you worship? I, it, at my age, it's difficult to say I worship worship people, uh, but I do think they are, you know, trailblazers. Um, you know, they are tech trailblazers in the old days, like Steve Jobs that people always you know, look up to as an innovator. Uh, there's Elon, obviously, uh, they are competitive, but and obviously he has built something truly great. Uh, we really thankful for his pioneering thinking and execution. Uh, and in China, I think there are a lot of the, you know, I think successful tech entrepreneurs. I, I mean, I, you, I, a lot of those actually my personal friends. I look up to them because the dedication and tenacity to get you know, to where they are today. So there's a, quite a few people I really admire along the way. Coming up, what attracted Brian Gu to a company at the cutting edge of green energy technology and the opportunities for growth in the EV sector. People are now used to driving an electric vehicle. Uh, it's no longer a foreign object. People are building a behavior of charging, of planning their trips, uh, and also the benefit of smarter electric vehicles are getting the consumer attention. So people are now enjoying to showing off you know, these technology products. Brian Gu is president of Chinese EV maker Xpeng, one of the companies hoping to bring electric cars to the masses and revolutionize the technology of transport along the way. We discuss what attracted him to the sector and its opportunities for growth. Brian, why EVs? So is it something that you think will be disrupted and so it will change the way we drive and use our cars? Or is it, does it come from a passion for things that are green? If it's purely electric, um, I don't think it's exciting to me. Uh, I think uh, EV obviously is a is, is a very uh, a new thing and it's disrupting the automobile world today. But what I'm actually excited about is the smart EV. I think an e electric vehicle that really have the capability to be smart, that has autonomous driving capabilities, that has the smart cockpit that people can enjoy a very different way of you know, really driving and utilizing the space inside the vehicle. So I think those are the disruptions of a future mobility that really excite me. So electrification how, is just the first step. How far away are we from that? I would love to sit back in a car and actually do nothing but read a book or maybe watch, you know, Bloomberg TV. Is that going to come in five years, 10 years? And what are the steps that need to happen before we get there? I think it's more like five years than 10 years for this to take place. But obviously for the entire world to enjoy it, it may take a long time because we have a big world. Um, and this will take place gradually. Uh, there's a technology path that we believe in, which will start from you know a driver assisted uh, functions to a truly robot taxi scenarios. I think that will probably take many years to develop. And as people and consumers and government gets more comfortable of these smart settings, you will start to see that populism of utilizing these technologies. So I think it will take, you know, five to 10 years, but I think it's more like five than 10. Is regulation the, the number one thing that I think is holding you back at the moment for autonomous driving and some of the other things? Or is it actually getting hold of some of the resources? You know, we talk about a shortage for nickel and lithium and the fact that you need a whole infrastructure for this to be the, the real thing that everybody drives around the world. I think the EV, the trend is very clear. I mean, if you look at China in the last 12 to 18 months, the penetration of electric vehicle in new car sales is growing tremendously. I mean, you know, the last, most recent month, it's approaching close to 30% penetration of new car sales. That's uh, new energy and primarily electric. So I think that movement is happening because uh, people are now used to driving an electric vehicle. Uh, it's no longer a foreign object. People are building a behavior of charging, of planning their trips, uh, and also the benefit of smarter electric vehicles are getting the consumer attention. So people are now enjoying to showing off, you know, these technology products. So I think that trend is happening. Uh, and obviously, there's a capacity constraint, there's a supply chain constraints that we're facing mm -hmm. today. Uh, but that I think will overcome uh, over time. Um, so I think EV as a category is already here. It's just going to be bigger and 
faster penetrating uh, the, the uh, traditional uh, vehicle world. On EVs, is there a worry about, you know, we see some of these sometimes, I mean, they're quite rare, but horrific pictures of batteries taking fire and these cars exploding. Is there still a worry on safety? Or what are the steps for EVs to really go you know, even more mainstream and into everyone's psyche? I think that's a good point. I think early days, just a few years ago, uh, I think uh, people worried about uh, EV catching fire, uh, batteries explode, um, and that happens. I think the, the cars now become safer, um, so these episodes have become less frequent. And also, I think the technology is now enabling a lot of these battery-powered vehicles are no longer will catch fire. Maybe it will have smoke, but it will not have fire. Um, there are technologies that's making the car safer. At the same time, I think the uh, consumers are now being educated, so they're not as afraid because those are happening in the much less frequency uh, compared to other accidents. So taking these in a balance, so cars become safer, consumer gets better educated. I think these issues are no longer uh, prohibiting uh, the growth of uh, electric vehicles today. And then after that, so when when's the step? Once we have that, do you need 80% of cars around the world to be electric vehicles to then go to the next step and make it autonomous? Or can it actually happen at the same time? Well, autonomous driving not necessarily has to be an electric vehicle. But electric vehicle has a lot of advantages to allow autonomous driving to develop because the electric platform is a lot more efficient than clean. Um, I think you know autonomous driving will develop alongside the energy revolution, uh, but it will probably be slower because it is a more technologically challenging uh, problem to solve, uh, and also it re re require more stricter uh, regulatory uh, policy change and accommodation, yeah. and also the, the consumer behavior needs to be educated. That takes a long time. So I think for autonomous driving, um, the technology is still not completely, I would say, there yet. Um, it's, uh -huh. it's developing very fast, um, but it's not reaching the, the safety levels that allows complete robo-taxi utilization uh, uh, in the world. So that there's still way to go to put on the technology front. The same, similarly, there are also policy issues uh, where regulations does not have a clear definition of liability, definition of what is self-driving versus assisted driving, yeah. uh, and there's no legal framework. So that every country has to come up with that. Um, so that will take time. And the third leg of this is how consumer will accept, receive, and utilize such functions. The education process probably also will take a long time. So those three pillars used to progress at the same time and interwining and then finally get to the same destination. Up next, competing with Elon Musk. Brian Gu hopes his company can stand out in the electric vehicle market. I don't think we can replicate Tesla. Tesla is a unique uh, because when they found it uh, and then the personality behind it, uh, the product is beautiful, technologically uh, very, very strong. So in many areas, Tesla is Tesla, um, but x -Pen is x -Pen. Brian Gu rose up through Wall Street before crossing over to Enterprise, becoming president of Chinese electric automaker Xpeng. We discussed the challenges of navigating lockdowns and supply chain disruptions, as well as the influence one particular entrepreneur has had on the industry. When you look at, you know, the rise and rise of Tesla, it part, you know, it partly goes mm -hmm. to this personality, the fact that there's a cool guy at the top, that he's controversial, and people in the streets talk mm -hmm. about owning a Tesla. Can you replicate the same? Do you have to go a different route? Like, how do you look at, you, you know, any EV company's relationship in regards to Tesla? I don't think we can replicate Tesla. Tesla is a unique uh, because when they found it uh, and then the personality behind it, uh, the product is beautiful, technologically uh, very, very strong. So in many areas, Tesla is Tesla, um, but x -Pen is x -Pen. We want to focus on what yep. we think is important for our customers. Our customer like beautifully designed vehicles, 
either it's large yeah. SUV or sports sedan. We believe we have a very, very appealing uh, family look that our customers is really attracted to. Uh, they like to have user-friendly features inside the cabin that has a technology feel. It's very smart. It enables them to really utilize the vehicle that's different from traditional ICEs. Yeah. They want to have a vehicle that really can define the future. That's why we spend so much effort in developing assisted driving technologies that ultimately can lead to a hummus driving. And that's why, you know, I think uh, our products is viewed in China as one of the smartest products uh, on the road. Brian, when you look at the EV company worlds, there's quite a lot of them. I don't know whether you think it's a crowded market at the moment, but certainly you're not short of rivals. How long will it take to see the successes and the ones that actually will probably not survive? Smart EV is a very competitive industry. When I started um, working with XPAN uh, about four years ago, people asked me the same question. Oh, why do you want to do a EV startup? Because there are 200 <laughs> Chinese EV startups, in the, you know, they can find. I mean, actually, Bloomberg wrote an article on, you know, there are 200 EV startups in China. I couldn't find 20, 200 names. But uh, at that time, you know, we were faced with a very competitive landscape as a startup company. And a year later, most of startup companies disappeared. But our competition also changed. We're competing with Chinese domestic, you know, car companies that want to do EV. And a lot of those are very fierce competitors and we actually you know, succeeded in that battle. And then, then the next stage is a lot of the technology companies like Huawei, like Baidu, like Xiaomi want to get into the game. People say, oh, how are you going to compete with these large, well-resourced tech companies? Same thing, because every year, every stage of the development, you're competing with players and mm -hmm. that's how you keep yourself competitive. So we're not afraid of competition. Uh, we think actually competition is very healthy uh, for this industry. Um, and for example, last year, when people say, oh, Tesla is lowering prices on their products, how are you going to compete with them? Because your P7 is a direct competitor to Model 3 in China. You must be hurt because they're you know, lowering their prices. But that actually is completely the opposite. Because when they are become more competitive in China, they open up the market for everybody else. And because our yeah. product has very differentiating appeal to our customers, we also enjoy tremendous growth ourselves. So I think competition and growth actually go hand in hand. So actually we enjoy competition in a healthy way and we think that is actually positive for the industry. I mean, it sounds exhausting though, right? You, you have to look about, you know, the lithium, you know, the fact that it's actually quite difficult to get in charge or actually, you know, have some uh, of these raw materials. There's nickel, then there's, you know, the lockdowns. Are you ever just exhausted, Brian? Building a company is always exhausting. I think we're already lucky that we're in a sector that's enjoying, you know, uh, uh, growth, secular growth and tremendous momentum. So we're actually grateful that, you know, we are in the right sector of growth for the next, you know, few years at least. So I think, uh, but as a company, when you develop in China, you know, competing with larger players, uh, well resourced players, and also, um, you know, operating a pandemic world uh, in an economy uh, that's, you know, really being impacted, uh, consumption's being impacted. Uh, it is very challenging. Um, so mm -hmm. no one uh, as a company leader is escaping from that managing, you know, challenges. But I think that's how a company grows over time. You really overcome these problems. You do it better than your competitors. You really tackle the supply chain problems, the capacity yeah. problems, the pandemic impacted restrictions, um, you know, the you know, the international issues of logistics and, you know, supply chain disruptions. If you can handle it slightly better than your competitors, you will be ahead. So I think uh, it's, it's also fun when you actually come out of this process of competition and managing a tough environment to really see your team, see your company in a much stronger vein. How do you prepare, Brian, for potential risks in both manufacturing and supply management? amid, you know, the, still the spreading of the lockdowns in China, but also, I guess, the widespread acknowledgement that EV vehicles will get much bigger in the years to come? It's a very, very big question, right? I mean, as a company, uh, we see demand is insatiable. I mean, I think uh, the, the growth uh, trajectory of our sector is very clear. 
But getting there, there's a lot of problems we're facing today. You know, we, we had a supply chain disruption. We have consumption disruption because lockdowns are impacting our sales, services, and delivery. Uh, we have also, you know, issues, you know, to deal with, uh, you know, uh, you know, with logistics and transportation. Um, so I as a company, I think all I can say is we need to be very nimble. Um, you know, luckily we're still small, we're still young, so we don't have rigid, you know, department walls. We don't have large, you know, sort of fixed infrastructures to deal with. So we can be quite nimble. Secondly, is that you know we actually try to use technology to solve some of the problems. For example, try to you know work with uh, our suppliers to have multiple sort of uh, uh, testing on alternative components uh, that give us the flexibility to using our production line. Um, so we are trying to be as nimble as possible, but also as efficient as possible. Um, I think uh, given um, you know the flexibility in our operating structure, we can probably handle compare you know comparatively better than some of the larger established uh, OEMs. Uh, Brian, how do you measure success? I think it's the uh, happiness you feel at the end. But the success is first of all not external; it's internal you will be happy that you did something versus you, you, will, you will feel it. So I don't think it's a word or, or some number that really defines success. Mm -hmm. It's success that you feel like you're making the right decision, spending the right time tackling the problems every day. And then at the end of the year, at the end of the decade, at the end of you know a tough project, uh, you feel like you accomplished something that really made you happy. I think that's... That's the only thing that defines success, your happiness. When's the last time you felt that? We've, we've all felt that joy, right? A satisfaction or, or genuine happiness. I think it's a also continuous thing. It's not like you stop for a moment and say, OK, do I feel happy? You don't ask that question uh, you know, the New Year's Day or, or, or the anniversary or birthday. Uh, it's just every day you wake up or every day you go to sleep, you are you telling yourself, are you happy? I feel happy. That, that's to me is success is like that you are in the right mode. In their period of time, you feel very, very depressed. You feel like you're doing the wrong things. Clearly you're not successful. I think you just need to, you, you'll be driven by your own inner self and emotions. You'll know it. Brian Gu, thank you so much. Thank you, Francine.